secrets of SpaceX, Facebook might care about your privacy, and Lego takes on Minecraft. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 349 for Monday, June 1st, 2015. This episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Dropbox for Business. Dropbox for Business lets your team sync and share files just like Dropbox, but with IT admin tools that allow you to control and protect your company information. Visit dropbox.com slash twit for a free 14-day trial. That's dropbox.com slash twit. Welcome, I am Megan Maroney. Let's get to today's big news. Writing in the Windows blog today, Microsoft's Executive Vice President of Operating Systems, Terry Meyerson, announced that Windows 10 will be available on July 29th. We knew that we'd be able to see the new OS in this summer, but this is the first confirmed date. As they announced in January, anyone with a current and legal version of Windows 7 or Windows 8.1 can update to Windows 10 for free. If you're eligible, you should see a pop-up message that says Windows 10 is coming. Get it for free. And now to our guest joining me today is New York Times best-selling author Ashley Vance. Ashley is a reporter whose work has appeared in the New York Times, Business Week, and Bloomberg, among others. His book, Elon Musk, Tesla, SpaceX, and the Quest for a Fantastic Future was just published. Welcome, Ashley. Thank you very much. <laughs> As we were saying before the show, it's number two on the combined ebook and print New York Times bestseller list, number three on the print nonfiction list. Uh, people are actually reading The One Made of Trees. That's very impressive for a technology yeah. book. Yeah, yeah, it's good to see. I mean, you never know what's going to happen to these things after you <laughs> release them into the wild. Well, thanks so much for taking the time to come on. Uh, now, Musk is this larger-than-life persona. He's maybe the most interesting geek around since Steve Jobs. How did you get him to cooperate with your book? Well, it wasn't easy. Um, I'd done a cover story on him in 2012 for Business Week, and pretty shortly thereafter, I sort of decided that's what I wanted to do a book on. And, and so I went to Elon, and I told him I'd like to do that. And he told me, you know, he was very polite about it. He said six or seven people had asked him to do a book in the past and he'd said no and he wanted to do his own book and so he turned me down and then basically I reported for 18 months. I just kept interviewing people and he kept getting phone calls from people telling them that I was out there, you know, <laughs> making all these calls and um, and then he, he called me at home one day and he said, look, maybe I'll cooperate and let's have a meeting and then, and then he ended up um, doing interviews and letting me talk to people at the companies. Well, he wanted to read it all first, right? And make footnotes? Yeah, I mean, he came with this sort of very Elon proposal, which was uh, he wanted to read it first, which I definitely did not want him to do because it's just sort of not really the way a journalist would go about it. And then he wanted to put footnotes in, which I was like briefly intrigued by the idea of that just because he has a unique writing style and and um, it'd be kind of fun to see what Elon's take on different things was. The problem was that he can be quite verbose when he answers things. And I kept picturing that the footnotes would be, you know, 40 or 50 pages long and, and be bigger than the book. That was smart. Yeah, I mean, his Twitter is so amusing to me. It's never just one. It's, you know, if he has something to say, it's going to be seven tweets, you know, or if it's yeah. going to be, you know. <laughs> well, and you can see his writing in the, I mean, he does a lot of the press releases and things like that too. I remember when there were the fires and then they added this uh, metal plate on the bottom of the Model S and, you know, I mean, this, the, the uh, language that, is in the press release, you know, as Elon is talking about, we broke the safety machine with how strong our car is and everything. So, well, you're going to be coming on an upcoming episode of our show, Triangulation with Leo Laporte. And that's a longer show where I'm sure you'll get into Musk's childhood and all the beginnings. So we'll, yeah. we don't have you for much time. So we'll jump forward to 1994 in Silicon Valley, where it was all happening. Uh, explain a little bit about Musk's first startup, Zip2. Sure. He he basically took a road trip with his brother, Kimball. Elon had been going to UPenn on the East Coast, and he they drive out to the West Coast. Elon had been meant to go to Stanford to get a PhD, basically, in physics. And along the way, just like you said, the Internet's happening. They sort of think, OK, there's something to be had here. We should maybe make a go for it. And they come up with this idea. Zip2 was kind of Yelp meets Google Maps, obviously, before those things existed. His goal was basically to help you find a pizza place in your neighborhood and get turn-by-turn -turn directions to it. And actually, Elon's mom, 
as far as I know, is the person who invented, you know, the reverse directions button so that you could get home. That was her idea. Oh, interesting. She always wanted him to come <laughs> home, I guess. So yeah. Musk, Musk also founded PayPal. You write that he thrived in the dot-com area because he was both lucky and good. Now, how did that translate into SpaceX, which she started in 2002? Well, that's... If ever there was a combination of lucky and good, that's it. I mean, SpaceX should not really exist. Um, Elon was good in the sense that uh, he took all his riches that he'd gotten from Zip2 and PayPal and was willing to invest those in SpaceX and, and sort of gamble it all. Nobody else, I think, would fund kind of a private space company like SpaceX. And then he was also good and he was able to attract just the most talented engineers in the world really and and get them to work behind this common goal and to um to really believe that this company could pull this this stuff off i mean in spacex got lucky over the years in so many ways getting money from nasa at just the right times and and then of course you know they had three failures and and ultimately got uh, their fourth rocket off which takes skill but also luck as well along the way Right. So now you have a lot of big scoops in your book. I don't want to give them all away. I want people to, to buy your book. <laughs> One story that's already been widely reported is that Musk considered selling Tesla to Google in March of 2013. Uh, tell us a little bit about that story. Right. It's this really interesting time in Tesla's history. The Model S had come out in 2012, sort of the middle of 2012, and it had gotten really good press. The, um, the names were Auto Trends, Motor Trends Car of the Year had all the early adopters buying the car sort of about 4,000 per quarter. But then it got to this, this spot where you sort of burn through the early adopters. There were tons of people who were in line to buy the car. They were in the reservation line, but they were not going all the way and, and placing their order because like any gadget, they were waiting to see if all the kinks were worked out. And this became a huge problem for Tesla. The factory was burning through money and they didn't have cars to build. And so, Elon has to go to uh, his friend Larry Page at Google and sort of say, look, I don't know if we're even going to make it through this quarter. You know, and he, he's kind of arranging a deal where Google would acquire Tesla and provide guaranteed funding to see the company through to their third generation car. And then in the background, Elon takes every single employee at Tesla and says, look, we've got to sell a ton of cars this quarter. I want if you're in sales, you're in HR, you're in finance, I don't care what your job is, get on the phone, call people who have made a reservation and close the deal. And ultimately, Tesla closes so many sales in a two-week period of time that they don't have to be bought by Google. They post a profit and the rest is history. Their, their share price goes sky high. It'd be really nice for all of us to have Larry Page in our pocket, right? Like, just in case it doesn't work <laughs> out, you know. <laughs> Not only does he have deep pockets, but he's kind of like a benevolent sort of, you know, especially for this kind of thing. That's who you would want to take over the company, I think. Right. So now Musk is quirky. We've talked about his Twitter. He hates acronyms. He's afraid of robots taking over the world. Maybe we should all be afraid of that. <laughs> I don't know. Do you think that this is necessary for the kind of innovator that he is? On some level, yeah, and I probably, you know, I think I argued that in the book. I mean, I try to I try to present everything and let people make their own decision. I think some people might walk away from the book and say, I could just never work for this guy. I think he's he expects too much out of people. I think, you know, it's really not the kind of work-life balance that I would want. I think other people probably read it and say, wow, I mean, this is where you go if you are committed to sort of doing something, getting to Mars, trying to clo uh, curb global warming. I mean, this is where you can go and make a practical, actual sort of change in these things. And I would uh, give my life for that. And and it's appealing to people. Right. I mean, it's, it sounds like Steve Jobs. I mean, he wasn't so easy to work with either, apparently. Yeah. I mean, you know, I... I tried not to do too much of just the jobs versus must thing, but I mean, on these characteristics for sure, it's, you, you know, I think Elon can be, Elon can be like even nicer than Steve Jobs, but he could be, he could be just as hard and demanding on, on the other side. Right. Well, now Musk is young. Will there be another volume? Well, it was pretty funny in the middle of it, you know, because he he hadn't wanted to participate at first, and then we're sort of going along, and we were never we never became friends, but we had a really good rapport, and um, and he's kind of like, you're gonna need to do a sequel, <laughs> and uh, I don't know if he would let me do it now that he's seen the final book, uh, so, but it was a tricky thing. I mean, you had to. I knew somebody was gonna do this. I was really interested in the companies and Elon, and it was hard to 
pick a moment when you're going to write something like this. Obviously, he has still has a lot to accomplish and prove. But um, so, yeah, I'm sure that there's more coming. And what about a movie? Well, there's talk. Yeah, there's people. <laughs> people were very interested, especially when the book started to do well. Um, so it seems like uh, the SpaceX story is, I think, what has really caught people by surprise. Is there's this part of SpaceX's history where they're off on this island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean trying to get their first rocket up. And it's, you know, it's quite the like Gilligan's Island of space tale. It's kind of it's, it's counterintuitive and amazing at the same time. Well, can I recommend Ryan Gosling or is he too old? I, no, I will fi I'll file that away and pass that along. <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, I look forward to your interview with Leo on triangulation. We'll go into a, a lot more detail. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time, Ashley. Ashley Vance, author of Elon Musk, Tesla, SpaceX, and the Quest for a Fantastic Future. You can get it from wherever books are sold. Take care, Ashley. All right, thank you. I'll see you next week. All Thanks. righty. Coming up, help find the woman who tried to recycle an Apple One, and ads are coming to Netflix. But first, speaking of ads, we have one right here, right now. At Twit, we've been using Dropbox to sync and share files for a long time. It's been a great solution for us. Now there is an even better solution, and we don't have to learn how to use it because it's Dropbox for Business. Dropbox for Business is the better way to manage accounts, manage billing, have visibility and control over your data. Dropbox for Business lets you do just that and you don't have to waste time finding a different solution. So what is Dropbox for Business? It's the same easy Dropbox experience your employees already love and trust, which means less training and more productivity, simple storage and sharing for any type of file on any platform and any device. Dropbox for Business never runs out of space. Each user starts off with one terabyte and it's easy to expand. Staff can collaborate with team members and securely invite and control access to outside partners, clients, and vendors. But most importantly, for IT professionals, you have control. Dropbox for Business has powerful admin controls like remote wipe, intuitive sharing, and permission controls, plus complete audit logs. This way, IT can make sure only the right people get access to the sensitive company data. Dropbox for Business integrates with third-party security and administration solutions. And last but not least, the robust Dropbox for Business infrastructure uses encryption for file data in transit and at rest plus segmentation and hashing to anonymize files. Extra security features are available like single sign-on and two-step verification. Want to give it a try? Take advantage of your employees' familiarity with Dropbox and sign up for Dropbox for Business. Visit dropbox.com slash twit for a free 14-day trial of Dropbox for Business. That's dropbox.com slash twit. Now on to a few more stories we're following today. The ad-free party is over. The Verge reports that Netflix is testing ads for its original programming. Now we're ad supported. I understand the importance of ads, but for a company that was designed so people wouldn't have to see ads, I think this is going to be difficult for some people to stomach. Netflix CEO Reed Hastings has always said that the company would never rely on advertising. And to be fair, the company has said that these won't be third-party ads, but merely promos for other Netflix original series and only on those original series. Netflix also told The Verge that this is just a test and that they test hundreds of potential improvements to the service every year. Many never extend beyond that. Do you remember Quickster? I bet Netflix wishes that you didn't. According to Ars Technica, Facebook will now allow you to add an open PGP public key to your profile for improved email security. The feature will be rolled out slowly, but once it's available to you, you can update your Facebook about page with your public key, which Facebook can use to encrypt notification emails to you. And the people you communicate with can use it for all their encrypted communication needs. Watch out, Minecraft. PC Magazine says a new Minecraft clone called Lego Worlds was released today on Steam. The game, which is part of Steam's early access program, is described as a galaxy of procedurally generated worlds made entirely of Lego bricks, which you can freely manipulate and dynamically populate with Lego models. Sorry, Mac users, a PC running Windows 7 is recommended. So who copied who here, Minecraft or Lego? What do you think? You can email me at megan at twit.tv or tn2 at twit.tv. Looks a lot like the Minecraft I know and love, but with Lego men. Did you know, do you know the woman who donated a rare 1976 Apple I to a recycling center in San Jose? The recycling center sold it for $200,000 and it's company policy to give the donator half of the proceeds 
The problem is they don't know who the woman is. She dropped off the boxes, which she said she was getting rid of after her husband passed away. She didn't ask for a receipt, and they have no way of finding her. No way of finding her? I will give Reddit two days to solve this problem. We got an email from John from Adelaide, Australia. He writes on Tech News Tonight, episode 347. You and Ron Richards gave a great roundup of Google I.O., Thank you. But he did mention one thing that initially got me excited, but turned out to be not quite as exciting as I initially thought. Uh, Ron mentioned the new apps and features of Google Photos. But while it is free, it's only free if your photos are less than 16 megapixels. Anything bigger uses your Google quota, your Google Drive quota. I pay, John, this is still the email from John, who says he pays for Flickr premium. premium. That gives him unlimited size and uploads which, in his opinion, is better value. And Flickr is the same thing. They give you a free one terabyte, but I think they compress your photos a little bit too. Thank you for the email, John. That is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. You can subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write to us at TN2 at twit.tv. You can watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. And don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today. That's every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific. 1 p.m. Eastern. I am Megan Maroney. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.